Hello, everyone. Uh, I think we can start now. So, uh, I have a question for you. So earlier I was just putting the lecture slides on announcement, but now I'm just uh, uploading them to like the files location. So I, I just want to confirm whether you have access to all the lecture slides. Yeah. In okay, great. So if there is a student who doesn't know like how to access the lecture slides, uh, just let me know. Okay. All right. And I'm assuming my audio is fine. If it's not, just let me know. I'll try to fix it. So last lecture, uh, we talked about filtering. And today we will see like how filtering can be used for a very important computer vision uh, problem, which is edge detection. So let me quickly give you an outline which, what we are going to cover in this uh, lecture. So first we will talk about uh, what edge detection is. Then we will briefly talk about uh, why exactly we need uh, edge detection, why, uh, why it is useful. Then um, a very important challenge which is faced uh, when we are performing edge detection on images, which is due to noise. Then we'll talk about how we can actually detect edges from images. Okay. So we will uh, try to cover a range of algorithms. So we will start with Privet algorithm, then we'll have Sobel and we'll have Mar, uh, Mar Hildreth, and then finally, uh, finally uh, Canny edge detection. So we'll try to cover Privet and uh, Sobel today, and these two hopefully in the next lecture. And I think there's a question, when will we discuss the class project assignment? So uh, I'm assuming that's like the, the final project. So if you have ideas, you already know what you want to do, you can write me an email and we will arrange like a meeting. Okay, and uh, if you don't, uh, don't uh, if you don't have any idea what to do, uh, don't worry about it right now, it's not the right time. So probably once we have uh, covered deep learning uh, basics and we have a couple of uh, programming assignments, then I think uh, it will be a good time to talk about this. All right. But if you have any ideas and you should discuss, uh, feel free to write me an email and we can, we can discuss it after that. Okay. So first uh, let's try to understand uh, what, uh, what is edge detection. So edges appear in images whenever we have uh, some change uh, in the, in the, in the intensity. Okay. So these edges, may represent some kind of semantic information or they might include some shape information and they might just mark like the borders of the object which are present in, in the scene okay and uh, these edges are more compact than pixels when you have to just represent them and the idea is like you only need information wherever there is the edge right you don't care about all the other pixel locations so if you have to store it memory wise, it will be more compact. So this is an example. This is like the famous Alina image. It's a grayscale image. And on the right, uh, I'm showing here like all the edges which are present in this image. So you can see that uh, these edges do provide you like some kind of semantic information. For example, if you just look at the uh, shape of this edge, like which is for the hat, then without looking at the other uh, edges in this image, you can kind of represent, okay, these edges uh, seem to be like coming from hat, right? So that hat is like a semantic meaning. Similarly, if I give you the edges for an eye or a nose, so without giving you the color information or any other intensity information about that image, you will be able to infer, okay, they, these edges actually correspond to nose. So they do have semantic information. And of course they do have uh, shape information because each object will have different uh, shape. And uh, sometimes they do mark like borders for an object. For example, uh, when I was talking about this hat over here, so this edge here is kind of a border for this hat as, uh, as we see it, uh, in this image, all right? And the third point, which was compactness, you can see that we, we don't have to worry about what's the intensity of this image, maybe at this location where it's all black. We can just consider that as background. So we only have to store like the, the values where we have an edge. So in that sense, it's like more compact. 
in comparison to the actual grayscale image. Uh, okay. uh, is there a question? Yeah, there is some background noise. If your mic is not mute, please, uh, please do that. Right. Thank you. Okay, so now let's try to understand uh, why exactly we see uh, edges in images. So there can be multiple sources. For example, if you look at uh, just this image, and again, yeah, we are just seeing edges of this object. So if you just uh, observe this location, so this is kind of the surface normal, which is like the, the vertical uh, direction of any surface that normal is actually you're seeing some kind of discontinuity because at this point it's visible but from the back it's not visible right because it's just a 2d image you can't see like uh, 360 degrees so then you are seeing this vertical edge over here right which is due to this discontinuity and you can also see like this edge over here which is kind of a round edge or an oval edge you can say so this is kind of the surface normal is actually changing. So this surface is kind of vertical, right? So the normal will be like towards me out of the screen. And as you move to the top of this cap, then it's kind of flat. So the surface normal will be vertically upwards. So that surface normal is changing. And whenever that surface normal, uh, whenever you have such discontinuity, you will observe edges. Okay, so that's just one example. So let's look at like some more uh, scenarios which can cause uh, edges. So you can have discontinuity in depth. For example, if you just focus on, uh, at this location, so this is kind of the object itself, this bottle, right? But right outside uh, this vertical line here, that's the background. And if you think about like in the 3D environment where this object was placed, the depth of this location from the camera or this, uh, this object from the camera is like smaller as compared to the background. So whenever there is a discontinuity in depth, then you will observe the, uh, these kind of edges. And then you can have like these edges, which is uh, caused due to changes in uh, the color. So in this case, nor your uh, surface normal is changing and nor your uh, this depth is changing. The depth is same, surface normal is same. It's just like the color information is changing. Right? because you're using maybe a dark uh, color to write this, uh, these letters uh, on this bottle. So then you have edges due to that color change. And another interesting uh, scenario you can have is, you can have change in lighting conditions. So you can call that illumination discontinuity. So you have a shadow of this object on the back and you can see here that wherever this shadow is like being projected uh, on, the, on, the, on the surface, so, actually mean physically nothing is changing it's just like the the lighting condition due to the shadow you have less light in this region all right the light is being occluded by this object and in this region you have more light and due to that change you are observing this edge okay so again these are some scenarios uh, which actually cause edges in your images when you capture them now let's try to categorize these edges into different types so basically, uh, we have these three different type of edges. The first one uh, on the left, this is called step edge. So step edge is like, uh, it's kind of a step on your uh, stairs. So you will have low intensity and suddenly your intensity will increase. All right. So you can see that this is just uh, showing you the intensity of the pixel. Uh, it's dark over here, it's light over here. So it was uh, low and suddenly there's a change. So this is called step edge. Then you can have ramp edge. And again, your intensity is low. And you can see here that it's kind of ramping up. It's gradually increasing. So the change is not sudden like this. And then it's constant. So that's called a ramp edge. And uh, then you can have a roof edge. So this is kind of a roof. So what's happening here is you have low intensity. Then the intensity is increasing. And then again, it's coming down. And then again, it's low. So this is kind of a roof. So again, an edge over here, right? So if you think about this, uh, this is kind of, uh, this will happen whenever you have, let's say change in depth, right? So you might get like step uh, step edges there. 
ramp edge is like uh, it could be change in gradient so if you have a shadow then if the shadow is not very sharp so there could be like some kind of uh, dispersion of light so you might get these kind of edges and again this is uh, this is you can say like the light is sneaking through right in between so if you have like some kind of split or gap in between then you can have these edges or it could be like some kind of uh, change in texture which is not continuous Okay, so again, some examples. Now that was all about edges. Now, uh, an interesting question is why exactly we want to perform edge detection, okay? And uh, the answer is when you extract edges, it can provide you a very useful information uh, from your images. And that information can help you in recognizing objects. They can help you in recovering geometry. And uh, as I said earlier, if I just show you these edges, it's it's very easy for you to say, okay, this is an eye, right? You you don't have any color information. It's not even a grayscale image, just a, just the edges. So that's why edges are important. I mean, you can do this. You can recognize objects, right? Just using edges. So you don't have any color information and any pixel level uh, intensity values. Similarly, like for nose. So just like four or five lines here, edges, and you can recognize the object. Similarly, like uh, mouth. And this is true, like even for complex objects, so, such as like if it's an airplane or a fighter jet, if I just show you these edges, you can easily recognize uh, there's a plane. And again, these are just edges and it's very easy for you to uh, recognize that it's a house. Okay, so in this case, you can see that uh, you don't have any color information, no intensity information, and this shows you like how powerful these edges can be if you can actually extract these edges successfully from images. Okay, so there is a question from a normal uh, edge detection helps in boundary marking of rooms, floor plans, and object mazes too. That's true. So you can have a lot of other applications uh, of edge detection. Okay, so now let's try to uh, understand the edges better from some uh, real world images. Okay, so this is a real RGB image. And let's try to understand uh, what kind of edges uh, we can uh, observe in, the, in such, a, such an image. So uh, right here, I'm showing a patch from this location. Okay, so here you can see that you have multiple vertical edges. So the first edge is over here, then the second, third, and then the fourth. And you can see that there are different reasons why you are seeing these edges. So the first one, I think it's just you do change, uh, it's, uh, it's change in depth. And that's why it's like the same uh, wall color, but you are seeing the difference. And then this is like change in uh, the, the surface normal. Okay, so normal is changing. And also along with that, you have a different lighting condition as well. And again, this is dark inside. This is like you have change in depth and you have change in normal, uh, surface normal, and again, change in lighting conditions. So all those scenarios which we studied earlier, you can see that in uh, uh, this real world example, all those scenarios are helping you understand why you are seeing edges in this image. Okay, so these are all the images and again uh, another patch from the same image you can see this is another edge and again like uh, in in the actual this uh, 3d world where this image was captured these colors are almost similar right because you don't use like different colors uh, in, in these kind of walls so it's similar but again due to different lighting condition and again change in surface normal you're observing an edge here so this is a patch from uh, the floor and here you can see that uh, actually we don't have like any change in surface normal or anything, but this is just change in the texture. And due to the change in texture, we are observing these edges. So it doesn't have to be like a, a, a proper edge in real world. Uh, so uh, which, which actually always causes uh, edges in your captured images. So, okay, so now, <clears throat> Let's try to like investigate further uh, when we have this changing intensity, how we can use that to detect edges. Okay, so uh, that's the, let's, let's call this characterizing these edges. So what might happen is if this is your image, 
then whenever you have an edge, then what will happen is the intensity. So let's say you define your image as a function, then the intensity of that function will change. And whenever there is a rapid change, then you will observe these edges. Okay. So this is a, a sample from any given image. And here you can see that uh, this is like a very high intensity. Then again, it's a very dark intensity and a very high intensity. So we are seeing two edges. The first one is over here. The second one is over here. And when I try to plot this row, which is uh, indicated by this uh, red line here, so that uh, intensity profile is being shown here. And you can see that starting from the left point, the intensity is high, right? So the intensity is high. So this Y axis on the second plot is intensity. And this X axis is just like uh, this dimension, starting from this location all the way up to this location. So the intensity is uh, very high at the beginning, then it drops. So this drop is corresponding to this region here when we are observing an edge. And then again, it's very low. So this low is corresponding to this uh, black region at the center. And then again, it will rise and then again constant. So this is the second half of this patch. Now, the interesting thing uh, you can observe here is that whenever you have a change in intensity, right? So this drop over here, whenever you observe this behavior, then you might see some edge in your input image. Okay, so that's something which we should analyze further. So we have this drop or this change in intensity at this location, we saw one edge. And then again, the intensity is changing here, it's increasing, and then we have an edge here. So what we can do about that? We can actually compute derivative, okay? And derivative, we have uh, reviewed this, I think, in a couple of lectures. So you know what uh, derivative is. Now, what we can do is we can compute first order derivative of this curve. Again, this is a function, right? And when you do that, then, then that derivative will actually tell you when the value is changing. So first order derivative, just to, just to do a recap, the derivative tells you how your function is changing. Okay. So in this case, the function is not changing at all. Therefore, the derivative is zero. And suddenly you saw that, okay, the function is changing and it's going down. All right. Which means that the rate of change is actually negative. And that's why you get a negative value. And at this point, uh, at this point, again, it's trying to, it's actually increasing, right? It's increasing because the change is actually slowing down. So the maximum change you will observe is at this location, at the center, just at the center. Then the change is actually slowing down. And as you reach this point, the change is again, very minimal, minimal. And at this point, it stopped changing. So then the second half, which is rising above, that derivative is corresponding to the second half. And again, there is no change from this location to this location. So it's again zero. And again, the change is uh, it's increasing. And that's why you're getting like a higher derivative. And again, the peak is corresponding to this point here when it's not changing. And again, it started to decrease. All right, so it's coming down. So you can compute a derivative of this kind of intensity profile. And what you observe here is that whenever you see a dip or a peak, then those dips and peaks corresponds to edges in your input image. Right? So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to use first order derivative to determine edges in your images. Uh, excuse me, professor. Uh, yes. I have a doubt. I'm not able to understand the second half of the dip as the rate is still decreasing, right? In the intensity mm -hmm. function. So why the, like, the, can you explain the second half of the derivative? Not able to understand. This, so yep. this dip is clear, but this rise is not clear? Yes, exactly. Okay. Because the rate is still so, decreasing, right? In the intensity function graph. No, no, no. So function itself and rate of change, both are different. So function is changing from all the way here to here, right? And yep. that's why you are getting some magnitude for your derivative. The question mm -hmm. is, what's the direction of change, whether it's decreasing or it's increasing? Yes. 
all right so when you go down so at this point as you start moving towards uh, the bottom so initially the rate is low right mm -hmm. and then it's increasing increasing and at this point so, so okay so let me uh, draw this analogy the rate of change is actually the gradient or the slope of this curve yeah uh, you understand that okay huh, yeah, so, the slope, okay, so the slope here is zero so no change mm -hmm. then the slope yeah. started to increase and at this point when you compute the slope that's kind of the maximum slope you can get if you go okay, beyond okay. this point again the slope is actually trying started to decrease after oh, this point yeah. right okay and mm -hmm. as you reach this point the slope is again zero yeah got so it that's got why it. the okay mm -hmm. right? okay thank and you. similarly like yeah. this peak will be similar to that so that's how you get the derivative and you can just look at these peaks the extreme i can call them so they will correspond to edges in your input image now let's try to do that in this uh, real world image so let's draw an intensity profile for uh, this row it will look something like this okay so the y-axis is intensity and the x-axis is like starting from left location all the way to the right so zero is the first pixel here 600 is the last pixel which means that this image has 600 pixels in the width okay so we start from here you can see that it's kind of fluctuating a little bit so this is corresponding to uh, the pixels on this wall and as soon as we saw like the first edge over here okay so you still have some fluctuations so it's very hard to see those edges which is like due to change in like small variation in lighting but as soon as you reach like the the dark edge which is like due to uh, this black patch on the background right you see a great depth Okay, so this is the uh, intensity profile of this row, right? Now you can see that uh, whenever it's changing, you are kind of seeing, okay, there's an edge. Now let's try to compute the first order derivative of this function. Now it will be like this, okay? Now you can see that whenever you are seeing a dip or a peak, then that corresponds to the edges in this line here. And you can see that with okay, some of the uh, edges we are missing, for example, the first one, which was very subtle, it's very hard to determine, but most of the other edges, even like the second one, you are seeing a big dip here, right? So these peaks or these dips are actually capturing all the edges in this image. So that seems easy, but actually it's not that easy. And there are some challenges here. We'll uh, try to talk about uh, those. The first challenge is, what if I introduce a very, very small amount of noise in my input image and with, which usually happens a lot, all right? Whenever you capture an image, there will be some noise. So then after computing the derivative, you will get something like this. So if you compare this derivative with the first one, which was pretty clean, you can easily say, okay, these are the edges. It's getting difficult. So the idea here is whenever you have noise in your input image, your detection of edges, uh, it's, it's, it's getting harder using these derivatives. So now let's try to understand this uh, better with like a very simple example why this is happening. Okay, so let's say we have again a very simple intensity profile. Now the intensity is low, it's increasing and then it's high. So this is kind of a clear edge. We can easily determine this, right? Now we try to add some noise in the input signal. Input signal. Okay, so this could be like a uniform noise, Gaussian noise, doesn't matter. It's just some noise. Then you can see that the, the curve is not smooth. So it's fluctuating a lot. And that fluctuation is due to noise. Now this is a noisy signal, FX. And if we compute derivative of the signal, we will get something like this. Because your intensity is actually changing a lot in the local neighborhood. And that's happening because of noise. Which means, as a human like we were clearly able to say there was edge over here. But using derivative, again, it's very blurry. We can't say anything. Okay, so the simple scenario is very, very complicated now. 
Now let's see how we can easily uh, fix this issue using filtering, which we have uh, learned in the last lecture. Okay, so these different filters or derivatives, uh, they respond very strongly to noise. As I said, like in the local neighborhood due to noise, uh, the, the intensity will change very, very uh, sharply. And due to that change, uh, it's very, very hard to actually get a very clean response using these uh, derivatives. Okay, so as I said, uh, we can use filtering. So let's, let's try to uh, use a smoothing filter. And you know what a smoothing filter is. You can use maybe just box filter or you can use a Gaussian filter. In this case, let's try to use a Gaussian filter. So this is the original signal uh, with some noise, which we saw earlier. And this is our Gaussian filter. All right. Now we can apply this Gaussian filter on this uh, input signal, which we have learned how to do that. So if you have any doubts or questions in that, uh, just let me know, but I will move quickly uh, on this. So after filtering or using this Gaussian filter on this uh, signal, you will get something like this. And you can see that all the noise is kind of uh, gone. Okay. And once you have this uh, filtered signal, then you can compute the derivative. And now you will get a very, very clean uh, rise here or a peak here for this corresponding edge. Right. So what we do is when we have a noisy signal, we just use filtering. And after filtering, we compute the derivative to find the edges. So let's see like if we can uh, optimize this further because this seems like too complicated. We have the kernel and then we have to perform filtering and then compute derivative. So what we can do is we can actually use a very simple property of convolution. So if you are trying to convolve two different functions or find correlation between two different functions and find the derivative, then we can actually find the derivative of one of the function and then convolve with the filter. And this is also true for if you find the derivative of the function and later convolve with the filter or convolve with the image itself, right? So you can put F inside and G outside as well, both will work. And we're not going to derive this. It, it's a very lengthy uh, derivation, but if you're interested, uh, let me know. I will refer you to uh, the exact location in the book where you can find a uh, derivation for this. But this is a nice property of convolution. And let's see how we can uh, use this to optimize our edge detection process. So because of this uh, interesting property, what we can do is, so earlier what we were doing, we, we have this image function f, we have this filter, we were convolving these two right and then we were computing derivative but during uh, due to this uh, property what we can do is we can compute the derivative of the filter first and then we can perform convolution so the the interesting thing about that is because your filter is not changing your function or your signal might change but your filter will be fixed right you're not going to change your filter and so what you can do is you can compute the derivative of your filter beforehand, and that will be just one time computation. So once you have that derivative, then you can use that to filter the original signal and you will get the same result, which you were getting in the previous slide. Okay. So these were like three steps, but you re reduced them to two. So that's kind of an optimization. And Again, I mean, you can easily compute this derivative, right? So this is just a Gaussian function. And to understand this, uh, I can go through, uh, go through this quickly. So in the Gaussian function, so this is again your Gaussian, right? So it's, it's uh, kind of a zero, not changing. And that's why it's starting from zero. Then it started to increase, all right? And that's why it's increasing. And again, as I explained previously, like, the rate of the rate of change is actually reducing after this point and that's why it's coming down and at the top of this gaussian it's actually not changing at all it's at the peak and that's why it's crossing the zero and then again for the second half of this gaussian you will repeat this curve okay so that's why the derivative of gaussian will give you something like this and this is important because this will come later as well when we compute double derivatives so if you don't understand uh, this uh, please let me know. We can go through this again. 
Okay, so now let's uh, see some uh, real examples of how that uh, smoothing and then computing derivation was done. So this is like a uh, smoothing uh, of one pixel. Right, this is like using smoothing of three pixels. So this means like you're not doing anything. And this is using three pixels. And this is seven pixels. So what I'm trying to show here is that if you increase the the size of your smoothing or the size of your smoothing filter, then you're kind of might be getting rid of noise, but then you're also getting rid of edges. So your edges are also getting very, very like smooth, smoothed out, right? So there should be like some nice balance between how much uh, you smooth your image so that you are able to detect edges. You don't want like too much blur in your uh, on your edges. Okay, so you'll have to be careful about that smoothing operation. Now let's see how, uh, let's say we have some uh, edge detection algorithm, how we can evaluate it, how good that edge detection algorithm is for performing. So what we do is, let's say we have uh, this whole world and this blue circle here is like what uh, our net uh, what our method is saying our edges all right so all the edges which our network has or a method has determined are inside this blue circle and let's say the actual ground truth edges were inside this circle this red one so the red circle is ground truth the blue is uh, what we predicted now the intersection of these two which is this region right here this is called true positive okay so the edges which we detected detected which were actually edges and that's why true positive and then we have two negatives like in the background here which doesn't have any overlap uh, with either of these so this means like these were actually not edges and we also said these are not edges therefore true negative the two other which are very interesting is like false positives so the false positive was like this region which our method says are edges but in fact they were not edges right so we said positive but in fact they were false so false positive and finally uh, this last leftover region here which is called false negative right so these were the actual edges so these are inside the red circle but these are not inside the blue circle so we kind of missed those edges. And when we are missing, it means we are saying they are not edges. So we are saying they are negative, but that was not true. That's why it's false negative, okay? So once we have these numbers, we can easily compute precision and recall. So precision will be uh, true positive over what we predicted, the results of method, all right, these two numbers. And recall will be true positive over the actual ground truth. Okay, so let me try to explain what this means. Precision is whatever we predicted, which is like RM, how many of those were actually true? So that ratio, so that's precision, right? So you're predicting something, then whether that, that prediction was correct or not. So that indicates precision. Recall is whether you were able to predict all the edges or not. Okay, so all the edges are ground truth and whatever you recovered was true positive. So this ratio is called record. So recall will try to measure if you were able to detect all the edges or not. So for example, if there were thousand edges and you only detected 10 of them, then the recall will be very bad. It will be 10 over thousand, all right? And you might, be, you might have very high precision it could be like you only predicted 10 edges and all of them were actually real edges. So your precision will be 100%. So we want to balance these two. So we want high recall and we want high precision. Okay, so to do that, uh, these are some design criteria whenever you develop an algorithm for edge detection. So you want to detect all the real edges and we want to ignore noise and other artifacts which could be there in the image. The localization of the edge is really important. So if this is the true edge, then you want like a very, very fine boundary. So if you predict something like this, it means your detected uh, detection algorithm is not robust, okay? Because your edge should not be scattered. Again, this is poor localization. And this is something which happens a lot. 
so you don't want to over predict so in this case you are saying all of these are edges right in fact only this was these pixels are edges so too many predictions is also not good so in this case what will happen is you will have a very high recall because essentially you predicted all the ground truth edges right but your precision will be very low because all the extra predictions these are false predictions so that's why we need both like precision as well as recall now this is a very nice curve uh, for edge detection and these this is like covering some of the algorithms which are uh, which are like uh, used for edge detection and starting from 1965 you can see and we are going to actually talk about some of these algorithms so we'll start from the Sobel, Provit, and we'll also cover Mar Hildreth and then Canny Edge. So these are pretty old algorithms, but you will see like they are quite uh, insightful. And this plot over here is like uh, showing you a balance between recall and precision. Okay. So ideally, what we want is we want a very high recall, and we want a very high precision. So a point over here will be like the the perfect solution. So this green dot over here is like human level performance, what like an average human can uh, do for edge detection. And you can see like it's far away from the perfect. And these are all the algorithms. So the first one you can see that it's right over here, way far away. And as we are moving closer to this corner, we are getting better, all right? So next is uh, we're going to talk about uh, these two algorithms, Privet and Sobel Edge Detector. And I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we have covered all the basics which we need to understand these two algorithms. Uh, so what we do is we just compute derivatives. We have seen that derivatives can be used to compute edges. So we compute derivatives in X direction and Y direction. Then once we have the derivatives, we compute the magnitude uh, of those gradients. And that magnitude will give you whether edge is present or not and then we use some kind of threshold on those uh, magnitudes to say that okay whether this is an edge or not so it's pretty that, that that that's all that's all what we need okay so pretty straightforward and before that let me let me do a quick uh, recap of uh, derivatives which will be useful i think there is a question from uh, sean how does deep learning perform compared to all those algorithms from the previous slide? So deep learning, deep learning mean they are uh, better than those. So I have a plot later on uh, where we are going to discuss that. Okay, you can wait until then. Question from Fernando. How do we know human level is not perfect? Human level is not perfect because, I mean, those are not experts. Right, because and they will make mistake. So one way to do that is you can synthetically create edges, right? Where you know that because you created it synthetically in a very like uh, non-real environment, then your machine can't be wrong. And then you can ask humans to actually detect edges. And then you know when they make error. Okay, Fernando, did, did that answer the question? I think. So, so let me let me talk a bit more about that. So, human, ideally, if I just show you one edge, I'm sure you will be able to do it, right? But when I ask you like to draw the edges in a very complex image, then there will be some kind of fatigue and other factors as well, right? And you might miss some of the edges, and that's why it's not perfect. So that's one reason. The, the other reason is detecting edges, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, subjective as well. So some of the lines, you might say it's an edge. Sometimes you might say it's not an edge. You say it's not an edge, right? So sometimes the subjective nature of uh, the problem also makes a difference. And same is also true for phase detection, right? I mean, human level performance means it's not 100%. So it's not just for edge detection, it's like for all the computer vision problems we have. Humans will, I mean, they are hardly 100% uh, perfect in all those problems. Okay, so that's fine. So let's do a quick revisit on uh, the derivatives, which uh, we have seen earlier. So we saw like backward difference. 
we also saw forward difference and then we studied central difference and the idea was this is kind of a discrete version of derivative not the continuous version you can just compute the derivative using like a difference of two neighboring pixels right and you can have mask for uh, these derivatives as well so if it's backward it minus one 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 negative one negative one zero one and you can directly use these masks on images to compute the derivatives and now we are going to actually compute derivatives on images so these masks will uh, come very handy so if you have any doubt any question uh, let me write uh, let me know uh, right now we can clarify uh, clarify those okay so those were masks for one dimension function but as we discussed we can compute derivatives on images as well the only difference is uh, now we'll have two dimensions so if we have to compute gradient we will compute partial derivative in x direction partial derivative in y direction and we can create a vector out of that and then we'll have to compute the magnitude so we take the partial derivative of each direction square it and then take the under root or the square root and we will also have a gradient direction which can be computed using this formula so it will be just tan inverse fx over fy all right so this is just like a revision and then we have seen uh, how uh, the image will look like when we compute derivatives and there we also discussed like how the horizontal derivative is giving you the vertical edges and the vertical derivative is giving you the horizontal edges so this is kind of uh, we have covered as well but uh, now we are like looking at the exact algorithm how we can actually detect these uh, algorithm uh, these edges in, in the image so the first algorithm is private edge detector what we do is we take the image we perform a uh, smoothing filtering all right which will give you blurred image then you compute derivative or you can say filtering in x direction all right and that will give you edges in x direction which means like all the vertical edges similarly you can take the image again the same image you can perform smoothing in y direction that will give you blurred image and then you can compute derivative in y direction okay then that's going to give you edges in y direction so that's the filter for smoothing in x direction that's the uh, derivative mask filter and you can in fact combine these two together in one step which is going to give you this filter okay so this you can see that you have plus and negative one right so it's kind of computing your uh, edges in x direction and since the size is three cross three and you have all over one it's also compute it's also performing this smoothing operation similarly you will have this filter for edges in y direction all right so once you have these edges, you can just uh, compute the magnitude and use a threshold. So this was private, by the way. Sobel is almost similar. It's just like the, the values in the filter are uh, slightly different. So all the steps are almost similar. But you can check here. The only difference is the smoothing filter. So this is not exactly box filter which you are using in private uh, edge detection you are giving slightly higher weightage to the center pixel and due to that your uh, the the final filter if you combine these two and try to perform this in single step your uh, filter will be slightly different you will have two and negative two in the center and again two and negative two in this vertical center so that's the only difference between sobel and uh, private edge detector otherwise all the the all the steps in the algorithm exactly the same okay so <clears throat> so what you do is you have the image as i said you can combine those two operations using this sim, uh, single operation so you have this combined filter this is for x this is for y so after applying this filter it will give you derivative on the uh, on the blurred image right so this is partial derivative of the image in x direction and this is going to give you partial derivative of i in y direction and you know how to compute magnitude you just square e each of these values sum those and take the square root that will give you the magnitude and then you will have to set a threshold which will say okay if a value is greater, greater than this magnitude then it's an edge if it's not greater than this magnitude it's not an edge so you do, do this thresholding 
and then you will have the final edges. So question from Daniel, why is derivative mask flipped? What do you mean by flipped? Where is it flipped? You mean this one, one and negative one? Yeah. So this is like a kind of a forward difference and that's what they use. But let me tell you this one, even if you use a backward difference, it's negative one and one, the result is not going to change. You will get exactly the same result. And I can explain that to you intuitively and you can think about that. So when you have a plus one and a negative one, what it's essentially doing is it's computing difference between neighboring pixels, right? So if you use one and minus one, what you do is you subtract the future pixel with the current pixel. And if you use the backward difference, you subtract the previous pixel with the current. So the only difference will be the sign. Otherwise, all the values are going to be exactly the same. You agree with that? Yes, Daniel? I see. Yes, I see. Okay, right. So the, the values will be same, just the sign will be different. But when we are saying that it's an edge or, uh, edge or not, we don't care about the sign, right? We just care about the magnitude because we are squaring the values. So we just care about the magnitude. And that's why it doesn't matter whether you take a forward uh, difference or a backward difference. Okay, I hope that was uh, clear. So that's the whole process of edge detection and this is Sobel edge detector. But essentially, if you just replace these two and negative two with one and negative one, it's private edge detector. That's the only difference. So now let's try to run uh, this uh, through a, a real image. So this is your original image and you perform blurring and you find the derivative, you will get something like this. You can do same in the y direction. You will get something like this. And the next step is to compute the magnitude. So the way the magnitude is computed is for each pixel, you will have a derivative in X and Y direction, right? So you perform this operation at each pixel level. So for each pixel level, you have a magnitude. And this is just showing the magnitudes at all the pixel locations. And you can see that the magnitude is high whenever you have an edge. And as I said, the sign will not matter. So it doesn't matter whether you take a forward difference or a backward difference. Now, what you can do is you can uh, put a threshold. So let's say you put a threshold of 100 on this intensity or, or, or this magnitude, and it will give you something like this. So all the white pixels are non edges and all the black pixels are edges. Okay, so any question until this point? Uh, professor? Yes, go ahead. Can you explain how this threshold thing is working? I'm a little confused with how we are getting the edges in black and the background in white. Okay. So you, you understood like for each pixel location, so when you compute the partial derivative, for each pixel location, you will have some value of derivative, all right? And then you will have uh, one value for x direction, one value for y direction, which is essentially giving you like whether there's an edge in these two corresponding directions. Then for each pixel, you can use this formula to compute the magnitude, okay? So then each pixel location will have some value, which will say how strong the edge is. So the, until that point, it's clear? Yes, it is. Okay. So then let's say the values you are getting in this map, uh, they are ranging from, let's say, 0 to 255. Yeah. Okay. And then you can do some analysis and say that, okay, I select a threshold of 100. Okay. So all the pixels where the value is less than 100, you say edge is not present, you just make them white. And all the pixels where the magnitude is greater than 100, you say this is an edge. And you let's say make them black. And this is what uh, you will get. Okay, right. The pixels less than 100 becomes part of background and the ones greater than it becomes the foreground edges. Edges, right, that's correct. Thank you. All right, great. Is, is so, there a strategy for picking threshold value? 
Yeah, that's a very, very good question. And uh, in fact, we have a lecture later where we talk about how we can automatically actually select the threshold, not uh, essentially for edge detection, but for uh, segmentation. But I think it will be very much relevant. I will uh, say you, you hold uh, uh, until that lecture, but uh, there are different techniques how we can do that, but do this, but uh, mostly what we do is we just try to analyze the image and we can do it manually. And uh, I do have another technique uh, which we are going to use like for the threshold, which is uh, much better than just a single threshold. So we will come to that. Okay. Okay. So I think there is a question from Anshuman, local mean. So you mean like for selecting the threshold? Yeah, I mean, you can do all those fancy, fancy things as well, but, but that's fine. I think let's not discuss uh, that. I mean, that will be like deviating from the topic, but of course you can do all those things. So that's true Anshuman. Okay. So, Right, so this is the plot which I showed you earlier. Uh, and the Sobel and Privet mean they were proposed at the same time. And here you can see that the there's a two uh, two years gap, like 68 and 70. But you can imagine like in 1960s, it wasn't like today, I mean, you publish something and you archive and it's immediately available, right? Those days you have to like print it, you'll have to mail it. And it was a very, very long process. So, but essentially there's a two years gap, but it was at the same time when these 12 months were proposed. So that's quite interesting. Okay, just like an, a difference in that number. So, and okay, so that's, I think uh, concludes uh, the Sobel and Privet. We do have uh, some time left. So I will continue to the next lecture. And if there are any questions, uh, you can ask me while, okay. Uh, let me actually quickly share the slides with you because I don't think I have shared those earlier. So I shared the slides uh, on chat, Zoom chat. Let me know if you don't have access to that. Okay, so until now we have seen uh, just the use of uh, first order derivative for, uh, for getting the edges, right? Uh, what we can do is we can actually <clears throat> go ahead and perform second order derivative and let's see if that can improve the performance. So when we compute the first order derivative, the idea was to find these maxima and minima points, right? The peaks and the, uh, the dips in, the, in that derivative to figure out whether there is an edge or not. And this is again the same example which I uh, showed you earlier. So this is the original signal, low intensity, high intensity, then low intensity, and we have these edges. All right. Now, if you compute the first order derivative, uh, we have discussed, you will get something like this. Right now, you can actually compute second order derivative. So it will be just a derivative of this first order derivative. And again, as you are I was explaining you the derivative of the Gaussian curve, right? So this is kind of a Gaussian and computing a derivative of this is going to give you a curve like this. And I can quickly go over this again. Let me know if you don't understand this. It's not changing. So it's zero and it has started to increase. All right. And that's why it's going up. And again, at this point, the slope is going to be maximum. And that's why we have a peak here. And as we move away from the center to the peak, again, the rate of change is reducing and it's going down, all right? 
and at this peak it's not changing at all so it's close to zero and that's where we are at this crossing all right and then again it's the repetition of the same curve but again in the opposite direction all right and that's how you get the second order derivative of this first order derivative and you can see that if you have a signal like this second order derivative is going to give you something like this so this is quite interesting now using first order derivative you have to look for like these peaks and dips but in second order derivative you can see that you have to look for these crossings so we call the uh, we call these zero crossings right? so whenever your second order derivative is crossing the zero like going from positive to negative or going from negative to positive so that's called zero crossing and whenever you have a zero crossing that will be an edge so that's the difference between first order and second order and you might have assumed uh, guess this that uh, these peaks and dips will it can be very complicated but this zero uh, the zero crossings will be much easier to determine in comparison to this right. so based on this uh, second order derivative we have two algorithms which we are going to discuss the first one is uh, mar hildreth and the second one is scanning and again, uh, both of them, I think, are almost similar, few differences, and we are going to uh, cover those. So again, the steps are almost similar. You first uh, blur your image. So you're smoothing, again, using a Gaussian filter. Then you apply a Laplacian, right? So you don't compute the first order derivative. You compute Laplacian, and I'm going to cover this, what Laplacian is. This is, a, this is based on second order derivative. It's a widely used operator, and once we have the second order derivative, we find the zero crossings because those zero crossings are going to give you the edges. And the way we uh, do this is we scan along each row, all right, and record an edge point whenever we find this zero crossing. So for this, we'll have to compute the slope of the zero crossings. And this, I think, uh, we'll uh, talk about later the exact details, or we can uh, determine whether a zero crossing is present or not. Okay, so Gaussian is smoothing, this is fine, this is just filtering, you have your input image, you can use a Gaussian filter, okay, so this is a discrete Gaussian filter, this is like a smooth version. So Laplacian, as I said, this is an operator, the way to compute this is you compute partial derivative in x direction of that function, so in this case it's an image, and then you compute second order derivative, second order partial derivative in y direction and you just add these two so pretty simple right it's just you have to instead of first order derivative you compute second order derivative so that's the laplacian so don't confuse this with uh, the gradient operator so if it's an inverted triangle that's a gradient used for derivative and this is used for laplacian right so both are different now let's uh, try to figure out how we can find these uh, zero crossings. So zero crossings, we can have these four categories. The first will be when uh, your signal is like positive and it's going to negative, right? The second could, could be like it's positive, then it's going to negative, but it's also crossing the zero. I mean, in this case, it's also crossing the zero, but you don't have the exact value at that location. In this case, you do. And again, like these two variations in the opposite direction, you're going from negative to positive, all right? So what you do is you just compute the slope of the zero crossing. So slope means like if you have a value A and negative B, you just add these two and the absolute value of it is going to give you the slope. Okay. And then you can again have a threshold on this slope and you can mark the edge based on uh, this threshold. If the, if the slope like clears the threshold, it's an edge. If not, it's not an edge. Okay, so this Mar Hildreth edge detector, what you do is you have an original image, you have the Gaussian filter, you compute the Laplacian of that, and you know that uh, this is uh, associative, right? The convolution. So you can actually bring out this image and compute the Laplacian of just this Gaussian. And this is again the same optimization which you saw earlier when you were uh, when we were looking into that uh, private uh, edge detector right instead of three or four steps we were just doing uh, three steps there so the same optimization we first compute the laplacian of the filter and then use that on the image 
Okay, so this is fine. Now, if you have a Gaussian, so this G is a Gaussian filter. To compute the Laplacian, what will happen is, so this is your Gaussian function, and you can find the double derivative, that's fine, you can add, you will get something like this. So it's just a basic mathematics, nothing like interesting there. But what's interesting is you will get a curve like this. And this is called, this is called LOG filter. So this is Laplacian of Gaussian, right? And uh, you can observe here that this is kind of inverted Mexican hat. So if you just invert this, it will become a Mexican hat. And this red over here is like zero. Then the value of the filter is increasing and that it's then it's const constantly decreasing and going into this dip here, right? So that's a very, very interesting filter. So that's the equation of that filter. And if you try to dis make a discrete filter out of that, you will get these values. So when you do the programming assignment, uh, you, will have, you will have to get these numbers, right? For the, for the filter to perform the filtering operation. And here you can see that, uh, again, this is kind of symmetrical, right? So the values in this X direction, these are identical as the values in this direction. And you can see that there's a huge dip at the center, which is like the tip of the Mexican hat. And then it's going positive, And then again, coming down to close to zero. All right. So another interesting thing can be done with LOG operator is you can actually separate the X and Y direction to optimize it further. So this is similar to like how you can separate your Gaussian filter, which we saw earlier. So you don't have to apply like the Gaussian filter in X and Y direction at the same time, you can compute the filter at the, in the X direction, and then you can compute in the Y direction, Y direction, add those up. So that will be uh, equivalent. Okay, so the way it's uh, optimizing is when you have a Gaussian filter, so let's say your kernel size is N cross N. So then e at each location, you will have N square multiplications, all right? But if you try to separate this into two one-dimensional Gaussians, which you can actually do if you look at this equation of Gaussian. So this is e raised to the power uh, raised to power x square plus y square, right? And you know that if there's addition, you can break this down. So you will get something like this. And this is multiplication. So you can break like this 2D Gaussian into two 1D Gaussians. So in this case, what will happen is you have your original image. You take your x direction Gaussian, apply the filtering. Again, y direction Gaussian, apply the filtering. So in this case, what's happening is if your original filter was n cross n, each of these filters will have just n values. And this operation will require only n multiplications at each location, right? Because you only have n values. And again, this operation will only require n multiplications. So in total, you just require two n multiplications. So this is better than n squared in terms of complexity, again, depending upon like what's the value of n. So if n is equals to two, it's a two cross two filter. It doesn't make any difference. It's almost the same thing. But if it's if n is like three cross three or five cross five, then this is like highly optimized. So similar to this, you can perform uh, optimization uh, on your LOG operator as well because you can separate those two. Okay, again, these are just showing your Gaussian x direction and y direction uh, filters. So your LOG filter, when you apply onto your image, it requires n square multiplications. And again, because your filter size is n cross n. Now, again, we are not going to derive this. It's going to be complicated, but uh, you can break this down into this equation where you compute like second order derivative in y direction, apply on y, single order derivative in x direction, apply the filtering, and then add this to, again, just a symmetrical version of this. So this is equivalent to this. And in this case, you can see that you have n multiplications here, n multiplications here, so 2n in total. Again, n multiplications here, n multiplications here, 2n. So in total, you will have 4n multiplications, right? So again, that's optimized version of this where you have n square multiplications. So once you have uh, that separability, what you can do is you can take your image, compute the uh, Gaussian filtering in X direction, then in Y direction and add those up. So that will be your filtered image, all right? In case of uh, LOG, 
this is you can see like a second order derivative then in x direction and again second order derivative in x direction single order in y direction you add those up okay so these are just sim uh, simple steps you follow when you want to use separability and of course you don't have to use it if you don't want any optimization you can directly use the kernel as it is all right so this is just a simple optimization okay so now let's quickly go through uh, the algorithm so you first compute LOG, which is fine you already have that okay and you can do two things you can either use 2d filter or you can use four 1d filters all right so for 2d filter you will have to compute LOG of the Gaussian which I showed you in the previous slide that uh, two cross two matrix right you just compute a double derivative of Gaussian and if you want to use four 1d filters you will have to compute these derivatives all right and to compute the zero crossings you have to compute slope of each crossings and then you will have a threshold and which will mark the edges so this is the full algorithm for uh, Mahilrit. so let's see how uh, this works out when we apply this on an uh, image so this is the original image this is the allergy filter applied on this image and again you can apply directly apply the 2d filter or you can do the whole thing like compute four different uh, individual like one dimensional filters and apply those independently the result is going to result is going to be the same then you compute the zero crossings and put a threshold you will get something like this okay so one interesting aspect here is in your gaussian smoothing you can actually vary the standard deviation of a gaussian and you can observe here that what's happening if you are increasing the, the variance in your Gaussian. So in this case, it's one. So if you increase, you can see that you are getting a lot of blur and the effect of that blur on the object detection, you can see if the standard deviation is low, you're getting very fine edges, right? Very, very small edges, almost all the edges. So all the local edges are being determined here. As you increase the standard deviation, you are getting edges which are kind of high level edges because these are computed on this blurred image. Okay. So that's how if you want to control like the kind of out output you want, you just play with the standard deviation to control like the type of edges you're going to get. Okay, so uh, I think that's all uh, we are going to talk about today. The canny edge detector, it's almost similar to a uh, Mar 100, but there are a couple of interesting um, uh, interesting ideas in Kenny H detector, which we are going to talk about in the next lecture. Uh, any questions you have, uh, please go ahead. I have a quick question. Yes, go ahead. Um, when you said, Professor, that this is an allergy filter that we apply to an image, you didn't mean by a sliding window, typical filter that we have been studying. It is something different, right? It's like the derivatives thing that we have studied today. Uh, both are same, right? What's the difference? So when you do filtering, you do sliding window. Yeah, but when we compute the LOG filter, it's like an n-cross in size matrix. And uh, do we right. slide that n-cross in size oh, window yeah. over the image too? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because your image will be huge, right? It could be 600 cross 600 pixels. And your filter will be 3 cross 3 or 5 cross 5 or 7 cross 7. So you put that filter at each pixel location in your input image. So this is exactly what we discussed in the last lecture when we were talking about filtering. This is also filtering. It's a different okay. story that we are computing edges. Right, that makes sense. Thank you. Right. So question from Fernando, when is the assignment going to be due? So yeah, now we have covered uh, this edge detection, right? So there will be a, an assignment, programming assignment on this. And whenever we release that, probably sometime next week or or maybe this Thursday, right? Because we will be covering canny edge detection, right? So sometime later this week we will release and then we'll have two weeks to finish that. Okay, so I hope that answered your question, Fernando. Uh, so question from Sean. Will the homework to assignments will be posted? Yes, I think it should be. 
it should be there okay so is it already graded or not so i think once a tau uh, grade those i think he will release the answers as well but if you want to know the answers sooner uh, just let me know just drop me an email right i will i will oh you have the grade but you don't have the answers so yeah uh, uh, i think we will release those later today let me talk to tau i think he should release the answers with the grade so just remind me if you don't receive the answers by tonight just in case i forget okay all right so if there is no other question uh, let's end it here and enjoy your day see you on thursday bye